Cocaine Cowboys, The Deadly Rise of Ireland's Drug Lords, the live show is on sale now. We're on the road on February 10th at the Lime Tree Theatre in Limerick, February 15th in Cork's Everyman Theatre and on Sunday 18th we're back at Dublin's Three Olympia. April takes us to Galway's Town Hall Theatre, Killarney's INEC and Belfast's Waterfront Studios. Check mcd.ie or venue for ticket sales. So no long we can expect probably next year to hear about his appeal. Uh, he has already lodged the appeal. But the podcast beast is flying. Mm. Have you been got a good reaction to it so far? Very good. Um, these podcasts, you, when you launch them, it's like they set sail a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. You sort of just poop them out like that. Yeah. And people usually, I'm a podcast listener myself, especially series, so I always have to it irritates me if I have to wait a week yeah. for the next episode. Yeah. Like I like to binge them. Yeah. So uh, all the episodes are up there now. And obviously we will return to it when there's developments in the story, which will be the appeal. Yeah. And so what, Claudia, you obviously were there for the whole trial of No Long. Can you summarise it quickly, I suppose, or not? Of course you can't because it was it was one of these really long uh, court cases and there was some really unique elements to it. Yeah, really long and very science driven. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of the time you're getting eyewitness testimony or you're getting, you know, it's just procedural guard reports, etc. Cetera, et cetera. But this is very much based on science, which was incredibly interesting to hear. Um, so I suppose it was unique in the sense that this was the oldest and coldest murder case to ever be tried in the Irish state. So it was 42 years since uh, Nora Sheen was murdered in Cork in 1981. No long initially at the time was charged, but the charges were dropped. Uh, years and years went by until the cold case unit or the serious crime review team and the Garda Shia got their hands on it again. And they started working on it and trying to develop um, a case against no long where they were investigating the case I suppose and I, one of the main parts of that was trying to they had their culprit um, they they definitely believed that that was him and it was only through um, DNA technology advancements that they were able to prove definitely that yes it was him um, He, she was found murdered on the side of a road after going missing I think she was missing for six days and then she was found uh, near Shipple Woods in County Cork um, no long was then you know there was DNA um inside uh, Mrs. Sheehan. She had been raped uh, and then killed and left there. And, you know, that DNA matched no long. Eventually they were able to match that to items in his home back in 2021. He was taken in, arrested. Now he was out on bail. Um, so during the trial, he wasn't, you know, he was out yeah. having his lunch with everyone else, which yeah. was a very strange experience. Um, eventually then after about two, two weeks on trial, the jury deliberated for about four hours and came back with a guilty verdict. And it was, of course, a, a huge moment. And when you, I remember when you first wrote about him, mm. Nicola, like how long, when was the first article? It was... 2010, 2011, was 2010. it? 2010. And at yeah, that point, like it was, it was already a cold case, obviously. Yeah. And The cold case, mur mur yeah. murder, murder Scott, whatever you call them, the, the, the crime review, the serious crime yeah. review team they're called. Commonly known as the cold, cold case, case unit. unit whatever, yeah. Yeah. So they were set up, I think, in 2008. Yeah. And when they were set up, there was, say, 200 unsolved murders yeah. going back to whatever date they started. It would have been the 80s, maybe. They, yeah, they, and some of the most, some of the point. really famous sort of... Mm -hmm. Yeah, really famous. Yeah, they, they looked at those and they looked at loads of kind of very well-known murders, but they kind of graded them. Yeah. So they looked at which ones would have a possibility of being solved yeah. because there's no point really in them putting all their resources into something that has little chance. I mean, there's some murder cases that you don't even have a suspect. No. And there's a lot of evidence has gone, yeah. you know, over the years and whatever, there mightn't be DNA. But I think the case of Nora Sheehan came up nearer the top because there was DNA. Yeah. There was a clear suspect because no long bizarrely had been put, he'd been caught almost immediately. Yeah. And he had been put on trial, but the trial never went ahead because two members of the original investigation team, one of the pathologists that had dealt with the report into her death, had both died. Which like was coincidentally. The system, wasn't it at the mm. time that if if the if if somebody if the guard wasn't there to give evidence effectively in person, yeah. the case would be dropped, which was it was exactly. changed by legislation, I think ultimately. It was, it was, but he seemed kind of like 
I mean, he just seemed to have, do you know, some people are charmed with a bit of luck mm. Mm. and that's what he has. And that sounds really weird saying that about yeah. a killer, a yeah. rapist or whatever. But he was, he got away with so much. And I mean, how many people go on trial or did go on trial? I think he, it was unique yeah. that he went on trial and that the judge said this case can't go ahead because of those two deaths, basically. Yeah. I mean, had there been one? they might have had enough to go ahead, but it was literally the leading investigator yep. plus the leading pathologist. So when... And they died of natural causes. Like there was mm, no suggestion yeah. there was any, you know, interference or anything. It had just been, it just happened like that. And then obviously then when when the cold case started looking into it, we started looking into it mm. sort of simultaneously. I mean, at that stage, <clears throat> it must it was a good bit away. Obviously it was another 10 mm. years before we brought the, the justice, but he did come face to face with the Sunday world, nonetheless, at the time. Yeah, I was doing, we used to do those pullouts. Do you remember? Yeah, I do. We used I do. to do these magazine pullouts in the, in the actual newspaper and we'd theme them or whatever. And that one was on cold cases or something. Yeah. Cold case murders. So I had taken a selection of them and I had sort of gone back into the details and whatever. And in this particular case, of course, there was this suspect. So I decided I'd approach him. Yeah. Um, which gave us an opportunity to photograph him and then to sort of name him, yeah. basically. And I approached him at this house in, uh, just outside Cork. You know, when you hit that roundabout, that's really yeah. difficult to get around. Yeah, you the, take a left towards, yeah. was it Passage East? Passage West. Passage, Passage East, East, I think, or something. Yeah. And I remember going out finding the house anyway, really neat. And he was with this, he was living with a woman, yeah. like in a relationship and everything, despite this background of having, he was a serial sex offender, is a serial sex offender, violent and, you know, volatile and all the rest of that. But I got up to the house. He must have come back in. Mm. And he looked like a biker, actually. Yeah, because he wasn't a young man even at that stage, that was stage, he? what would he have been? He was in his 70s, been in his 60s, yeah. mm. late 50s, yeah. early 60s, but fit and... yeah. The gates, he closed the gates of the house, which I was quite glad of because it was gates between us then if I needed to run. And um, I just called him over and told him who I was. And I just asked him directly, did you murder Nora Sheehan? Yeah. And his woman yeah. came in to defend him. Yeah. She was at the front door opening the door and she kind of came over and started roaring and shouting at me, the cheek of you, she said. Yeah. Who do you think you are? And I was like, well, I'm not yeah. living with a... Because of course he had serious been. A sex offender. Yeah. So... Mm. Because he did have that background of like right back to, was it the 70s, his conviction for? I think it's a, a charge that no longer exists, something car like law. Unlawful carnal knowledge, knowledge or whatever. whatever. But there was that incident that had happened in, when he was in the, was the army he was in? Yeah, the, so that was in back in 68. Like he was only a teenager then, wasn't he? Was, he was, yeah. Um, he had been, went over to the UK for whatever reason um, and he was in the Royal Irish Rangers there. And basically what happened was he was put in charge of um, the sergeant's house, wasn't it? Yeah. And he had gone in on a dare. He went into the house and I don't think he actually did anything, but he... There was a daughter the in the room house or something. the daughter, mm. yeah. And there was an incident there and then he was taken into custody, but fled custody. And, you know, there was a, a, a manhunt across the UK. I mean, it landed in the papers over here as well. And he lived on the land, like, didn't he? If, yeah, he was gone for, I think, about a week. Like his sister would have suggested eventually. that he was kind of sleeping out rough and all yeah. this sort of stuff. I mean, he was. Yeah. So we got incredible background, I suppose, to go yeah. along through speaking with um, his sister. Yeah. And Juliana, and that was somebody that you had met in the course of well, your after initial I'd dealings done, long. And, and of course, Mark Sheehan, who features in yes. the podcast as well. Lovely Mark. So when I did that story and nobody had written about Nora Sheehan in decades, probably, yeah. really. And actually, when we went back, Claude, we only found little, it's kind of weird, the only yeah. little tiny stories in yep. the papers about it and stuff, yeah. little bits. And it seemed to have died away very quickly, I suppose, after the case collapsed. Yeah, I yeah. mean, the, what was the point in yeah. continuing the investigation, you know? But um, I was contacted after that story because he was photographed by Mark, who was Nora Sheehan's grandson. Yeah. And he wrote to me to thank me for doing a story on his grandmother. Yeah. Which was lovely. Yeah. And um, in the meantime, then, I think... Juliana must have got in contact with me or I can't remember did I initially get in contact with her but we got in contact as well and she also was grateful that he'd been 
highlighted and, you know, his his links to the Nora Sheehan case, because at the time he was her mother's carer. Her mother was alive, mm. an elderly woman, and he had got himself in there as the woman's carer. And she was really concerned about her mother's welfare with him. Mm. Yeah. I think that's how we initially got talking about it. She had made a series of complaints to the HSE about it. Um, he'd locked her out of the family home. He changed the locks. She was concerned that he was feeding the mother. She was concerned at the state of her clothes and all the rest of it. And he had one by one sort of pushed the rest of the family away. Which mm. is a kind of a, a, a modus operandi of these guys. Like you don't just be, commit one murder or killing and then yeah. like normally for the rest of your life, that same sort of, mm. you know, kind of narcissistic behaviour continues yeah. in all yeah. other ways. And this was his way as well. He he did all of his victims throughout, like even his other victims of sexual assault, uh, his mother, uh, those victims, Nora Sheen as well, was a very vulnerable woman. Mm. And that was his, that was the way he operated. And I suppose as well, Juliana had this fear. I mean, there was a confrontation in the hospital yeah. a couple of days before uh, Noel Long's mother died, whereby he had grabbed Juliana out of her seat and there was... You know, the was physically assaulted her. mother was dying in the bed. Yeah. Like it was horrendous. And you, of course, Claude, went near most days to the court hearing over over those weeks. And <clears throat> despite the murder occurring, what was it, 41 years earlier, yeah. was it? Like the impact on, on Nora Sheen's family, it's still very visible. You could see that in the courtroom and from their, from, you know, the statements that they gave. Absolutely. It was very powerful. Um, it, was, it was heartbreaking as well because they were so... I can't I can't imagine how it would have felt for them to be there in that room with him after all this time. And they there obviously haven't lived with that for 42 years yeah. um, and not knowing whether or not something would ever come of it. And then finally they get this opportunity to see that if justice will be served and not knowing whether or not that's going to happen. And the fact that he was out on bail as well during that time couldn't have been comforting to them uh, that he got to live his life mm. as normally as possible. And, you know, Nora, Nora Sheehan's life was cut so short. But they were very composed. Um, yeah. They were very, um, they, they spoke very well about Nora as well in their victim impact statement. Um, and, you know, it's something that even we've seen through speaking with her grandson, Mark Sheehan, that that incident rippled down that family through generations. Mm -hmm. And the same on Noel's side of the family. It just was like, as Nicola, as you described it before, it was like a drop of a stone in a pond. Just yeah. the ripples just kept going and going and going. And so many people were affected from so many different mm -hmm. Families. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I suppose that was in in Beast, the murder of Norshi in the podcast that we made. Um, like we explored that. Yeah. And that was the point. It wasn't just to retell the story. It was to explore the relationship that No Long had with his own family who were very respectable. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they'd no dealings with criminality at all. He was just like a bad egg yeah. in that family. He was an anomaly. Yeah. And the 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 relationship he had and how his mother, who was loved by all her children and was a very loving mother, her relationship with him, how she always tried to protect him. Yeah. Even though he was what he was. Juliana at one point during her interview says he was pure evil. My mother could never accept that. Yeah. Mm. And I mean, you know, that's like, obviously they're, they're that's that's maybe the bit that, that you really bring at home, isn't it? Mm. The, the effects of having somebody like that and how, you know, how many lives are changed around it. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's extraordinary. And I suppose then as well, I thought it was interesting to explore as well, not just the victim's family, no. but that the two sides yeah. are affected. And then, um, you know, we won't give away the end of it, but there's a moment of, of um, realisation of that from both sides of, yeah. you know, of, of that crime. And the podcast does also sort of tell you something about the changing just the system, isn't yeah. it? Really, like because yeah. if you look back at the first case, when when was that? Was that? It was nineteen eighty one, wasn't it? Nineteen eighty two, maybe they, it hit the court. The and, went to court. So yeah. in that time, like that forty years, yeah. like the the ability of of how police deal with these murder cases, it's utterly changed. It's even utterly changed since two thousand and ten, isn't it? Yes, but interestingly, yeah. and, and we spoke to Dr. Maureen Smith and Sheila Willis from Forensic Science Ireland, both retired now. Yeah. But they were the ones who sort of would have received the collected uh, trace uh, evidence yeah, the from, the, see, from yeah. the scene. And they spoke about how science has developed, obviously, yeah. in DNA. Yeah. 
But the importance of trace evidence and the microscope, an eye to a microscope yeah. and how still, how still important that is. Yeah. And it was interesting because, you know, we often talk about uh, trials where there isn't a sort of a smoking gun. Yeah. There's bits of evidence that come together to form a rope. And they describe the science as being that as well. Yeah. That, you know, you can have DNA, but it can also be backed up by this trace evidence, yeah. which is specks of paint in this case. And there was, you know, hair and F -f carpet fibers, carpet and, fibers yeah. and stuff like this. And um, yeah, it was really interesting because, you know, they're saying nowadays that probably a lot of young scientists don't know what a microscope looks like. No. But yet... Yeah. What you get from that that trace evidence is still as vital and, and could be as important as DNA. Yeah, because you do. I mean, it, it, the DNA was, of course, challenges as well, wasn't it, in court? The, the, the type of DNA, yeah. like it is quite technical. It remind us about that again, the DNA, where it was taken from and how it was So developed. there was DNA taken from Norsheen's body Remains. and that was then compared to back in 2008 I think when the serious car review you team got a hand on it that DNA that was in storage was then compared to DNA I think they had on file belonging to no long and the method that they used so basically they had a tiny amount of DNA and what they had to do was kind of like in, like uh, blow it up like enlarge it and make it bigger so that they could test it you know, so that was an, enough of a sample to use. But the process that they had used, low copy number, um, to copy that and, you know, enlarge the sample, that was highly contested in the UK. Um, yeah. I believe it came into play, was it the OMA bombings case? I don't or know, it has been, yeah. There was, yeah, another, there was another case it was used in and it was contested and it was thrown out of court yeah. because of the way they had used it. But nevertheless, um, they were still able to use the DNA that they had gotten from No Long in 2021 to match that. And, yeah. you know, they said that it was one in 39,000 chance of it belonging to anyone else but No Long. Um, and it didn't really kind of matter in the end. But of course, you're a defence team. You're mm. going to try and take what you can to, you know, defense, do your job and defend yeah. your client as best you can. And fair enough, there might have been something in that. There might not have been. But it kind of, it was very technical mm. down to that sort of very scientific evidence that was given. And of course, there was, for the majority of, of this, again, because a lot of the people that were involved in this case were dead, their original evidence, uh, like uh, testimony, like witness statements, that was just read into the court. We didn't actually hear directly from any of them. So the majority of the of the of the evidence was scientific and mm. procedural. It wasn't. We didn't get to hear from anyone who said, "Oh, I saw Norsheen on this day or that day." There was just that um, evidence from their original witness statements read in, and of course, there was a law that up until nineteen ninety two, which meant that evidence belonging to a deceased person couldn't actually be admitted into a trial, which was the huge problem back in 1981, which meant that the deceased pathologist's report couldn't be used yeah, as part of the trial. Yeah, or whatever, yeah. Exactly. Um, but now that changed in 92, so it meant that could all be taken as part of the trial, as part of the case. And so, Nicola, you obviously wrote about no long previously. Mm. Like, what is the difference, you think, with a, the podcast telling a story like this, like a, a serial podcast to to maybe writing something. Is there a difference yeah. or... But like, I was actually going to say, isn't it so different to make one of those long form podcasts yeah. than what we do here? Yeah. yeah. I mean, this essentially is a chat show. It's totally yeah. different. You're not kind of piecing it together. And Ian Mullaney, the, yeah. our producer, obviously, did the hard nine yards with it because while we go and do the interviews and we would have sat here, we were what we were attempting to do is, I suppose, the case got underway. Yeah. We saw an opportunity that we could make something really good with this. Yeah. Claude is covering it. I get back in touch with Juliana. We start going down to visit her, doing interviews, but we were kind of in the moment with her because yeah. we were able to call her when the case was still on, record her fears that he was going to... Yeah, because yeah. she didn't obviously did not know that oh, how it was no. going to go. She just thought he was going to get off, didn't she? Yeah. She, she was really, really worried she was. and she was yeah. then worried about that obviously she wasn't going to say anything or we weren't using any of the interviews as the case went along because mm. it was a jury, jury trial, obviously. But we were collecting that reaction of yeah. hers um, and then the piecing of it all together into a story. It's a little bit like doing a book, actually. Yeah. It's mm. a little bit like doing a book um, and probably takes, I mean, we did turn it around very quickly. Mm. Um, thanks to Ian sticking yeah. his head into the, yeah. the edit. But um, 
I like doing those. Do you? Yeah, that was that was my first time. Obviously, you've done the witness and stuff before that, and I hadn't. And for me, that was a you know it was a great opportunity to get to do it. But it was also a really good experience. And I suppose to get to see you know somebody who consumes a lot of true crime content and podcasts, etc. It's good to see the human element of it as well mm. because that when you're when you're listening to all this stuff, you kind of get desensitized to it. Yeah. When you're actually in there in the moment, you get to see the victims um, be that both on both sides of the family because, uh, you know, Norty and her whole family, Juliana, they're all victims in this story yeah. of this one man. And to see all that play out in real time, um, it was very different of experience to, I think, if you were going, if when you're obviously, there's a lot of podcasts out there about cold cases but you're not coming at it from a live, this is happening mm -hmm. in real time perspective. And I think that's something that's very unique and very special about mm. this podcast is that we're getting those real time reactions. And we're kind of like, we were podcasting about this throughout the trial, but we couldn't talk about his previous convictions. No. We couldn't talk about the yeah. fact we'd been in touch with Juliana. We couldn't talk about how she was feeling. So it was great to kind of, it's almost like doing a, like I'm stuck, my head is stuck in the college work at the moment. So you're doing your little assignments, like getting yeah. to the end and doing a big thesis and you're yeah, just, yeah. here's all the, yeah. here's well, all one the thing I think is, is a strength of it like you hear Juliana like uh, no long sister but yeah. like if you're when you're writing it up mm -hmm. you take quotes and it it, it can become one dimensional can't yeah. it sanitised maybe well I don't know it's just one dimensional but when you hear her you, you get her sense of humour yeah. in it and you get her sense of you know maybe m being able to to make jokes in the middle yeah. of things and you get a sense of you know her emotion as well you get a more complex picture than because if you're writing those quotes yeah. down you know you don't, all of that you don't is removed that yes, from yes. the writing and yeah. I mean I think that's really the the secret of podcasting yeah. is to get that intimacy yeah. with somebody yeah. close exactly. to the story yeah. it's one thing you know journalists talking about it and whatever but when you have somebody who's yeah. been there from yeah. the beginning and is able to give you those intimate details and I think from an audio perspective yeah. because you don't have any other senses going when you're listening to a podcast yeah. you really sort of nearly close your eyes and you're there with her. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you're totally imagining as she's just, and she's very descriptive. She's yeah. very articulate as well. Um, yeah. So I think that's the secrets of good podcasting, yeah. being there in the sort of as things are unfolding. Yeah. Um, having people who are intimate with the story yeah. and having a bloody good producer yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who will who will make sense who will cut out sense. your uh, yeah what's yeah. cut out your uh, yeah what's makes cut it out, sound very intelligent yeah. doesn't it cut he? out all my bad language <laughs> yeah he left in the bit when you asked me to like Google Google <laughs> yeah yeah that was I got some messages about that actually <laughs> Uh, I do that all the time Claudia <laughs> I, yeah I'm not surprised yeah so Claudia as the true crime not, I'm going to say, maybe you'll have to chop that out, but did you learn, do you, do you pick up anything about sort of what is the difference between a killer and an ordinary person, if you know what I mean? Is that what drives people who listen to true crime podcasts like, like, like Beast Sweater? Is that what, what they're trying to understand, do you think? I, for me, it's all, I like like the puzzle solving aspect right. of it, of cold cases. It's yeah. trying to fit all this information together and what is that, like what actually happened? Because I definitely think people listen to true crime for different reasons. Yeah. Um, like I know somebody who also listens to and watches a lot of true crime and they will say it's because they like the gore. Yeah, yeah. They have no mm. interest in the puzzle solving. Some people are interested in the minds of a killer and what makes them do it. And, what, and I suppose that is part of the puzzle as well. But for me, it's all the little bits of evidence, the fingerprints, yeah. the blood samples, the blood splatter, all that kind of stuff that mm -hmm. comes together to solve a puzzle. Um, but for something like this, I suppose there is all those elements in terms of you're not only, you're seeing an insight into No Long and who he yeah. is, you're seeing an insight into how they solved the puzzle. And you're getting that human emotion as well. I think Juliana was an incredible interviewee. We couldn't mm. have asked for anyone better. No. She was so welcoming and hospitable with us when we went down to visit her. And she was, she is, I'm, I'm delighted that she is coming across in the podcast the way that she came across to us. Yeah, She's exactly. very down to earth and, and very um, articulate woman. Yeah. And I wouldn't cross her. No, no. <laughs> but because it is a big thing, isn't it? When you, when people get, you know, you're obviously one of the most famous people in this universe, Nicola. <laughs> no, but you know, like for, for ordinary people, when they first get into the media, like it's, yeah. you know, you, you become aware over the years that it's, it's a bit of a shock, isn't it? 
for them. It's been a positive experience for her though, has it? Hopefully, in terms of, hopefully yeah. it has. Yeah. And actually that's the responsibility of yeah. you as a journalist, yeah. especially when you're bringing people to audio and people yeah. bringing people to the film yeah. and to television and stuff like that, is to represent them. Yeah. I mean, that is a thought process. Do you know what I mean? You could just go out and bash, do an interview and throw it on. But you have to, and I have to give Ian credit for this because I think Ian is very good at presenting people in their best light. I mean, Ian was the producer on Witness as well, Witness with Joey O'Callaghan. And he just, Joey came across so well. And exactly that, how we find him, how I find him. Everybody says to me, such a nice guy, such a this. Yeah. Because that's a skill to be able to yeah. present them in the way that in that way, you know. And people obviously like people who've who've not been in the media for years, like they don't. It is a shock because you don't know they don't have the experience of doing it again and again, where they can yeah. know what to say and what not to say. And of course, some exactly, people do yeah. eventually. So you do, and you a, lose a little bit of your anonymity. And say that somebody said anonymity. That to me. Yeah. yeah. Let me try it again. Well, like anonymity. Yes. Got it. Yes. Um, You do lose a bit of that no matter what, because even people around her, while we haven't obviously shown her face too much, I mean, she has been interviewed before and she's been photographed and stuff, but she's not blasted out there every time. I mean, on the cover of Beast, we have a photograph, which I think is a lovely photograph of Nora Sheehan with her her lovely hat on her. And um, as those remember her, she is the victim at the centre of it. Yeah. Juliana might be telling a story, but Nora Sheehan is very much central to the podcast. But um, you do nonetheless lose a bit of your, and and people get nervous when they do something. 100%. When they write a book, when they do a podcast, when they come on something, they're kind of going, what are people going to think of me? Yeah, and it is a shock when you, when you know, for people when when they say, oh, you know, I heard you here, I saw you there. Yeah. Like yeah. It, it is disconcerting. I still get shocked. Yeah, yeah, of course. As you know. to you, when yeah, you're being yeah. doorstepped in yeah, Debenhams yeah. or wherever you are. Exactly. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, it is exposing. It's that feeling yeah. of being exposed, Vulnerable. even if it's... Yeah. Yeah. You kind of go, oh, what are they yeah. going to do? I hope I haven't insulted. Yeah. I hope I haven't done this. Exactly. I hope I haven't... Yeah, and become sensitive. And the sensitivities around that murder and yeah, because they her were family. Super, they were super, they were really really dignified, weren't they? The, the Sheen family. Yeah. Like it has to be hugely difficult to, to go through all of that all those years later, like 41 years later. And then obviously due to the nature of just the, the way trials are run, they have to go through the the Nora Sheen's background and all of that. It must be difficult, but they were really, really strong and good, weren't they? Absolutely. The sons in particular. Yeah. like Yeah, I mean, again, we don't know how we'd react yeah. in our own, unless we're in that position ourselves. You never know how you're going to react. But I do think that they carried it very well. I mean, they did an interview with Primetime yeah. afterwards. Um, and again, they came across so well and so dignified and so well spoken. And they, again, it, again, it must be it must have been hard for them. And, and they as well lost some of that anonymity. Mm, yeah. And they, yeah, they did, you know, yeah. became vulnerable in the sense that they were suddenly thrust into the limelight in a way that they didn't ask for and didn't mm. probably want to be. Yeah. Um, you know, nobody wants to have to do that, but they, yeah, really. I have to say as a small criticism of the investigation, the whole thing. Okay. This isn't to do with Encore Chavis. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or Drew Harris. Yeah. He's had a good few roastings, hasn't yeah, he, yeah, over the yeah. year? <laughs> Poor Drew, I'll have to write him, send him yeah. a Christmas card or something like that. Yeah. But anyway, um, I think they were too slow. Yeah. I think that there was the, uh, I think that uh, why ever it moved so slowly, they could have, that development of the DNA and the putting together of the case could have and should have happened quicker because you had a yeah. very dangerous man out there living yeah. in the community. He might have been getting older, but we understand that he had continued um, his sexual perversions, whatever you call it, that he had been investigated for a kind of... Um, other predatory behaviour. Predatory yeah. behaviour yeah. amongst amongst violent women working well, violence against pre- other men, yeah. you know. And women working in the sex industry, yes. you know what I mean? He, yeah. Vulnerable again, you know what yeah. I mean? So you've no idea why the wheels of justice took so long to yeah. turn. And I'm talking really, I think they had an opportunity for about 10 years or eight to 10 years before they actually landed yeah. him in court. Yeah. And it was too slow. Yeah. And, you know, I was talking to Brad Hunter, who we speak to in Canada quite a bit, and he mentioned something one day and my head came around like I was in The Exorcist. Mm. (laughs) In Canada, right, Mm. they have a cold case unit that takes a murder investigation after five years if it's not solved. Yeah. Five years. Wow. Yeah. And that's when they all of a sudden start putting fresh detectives, fresh eyes on it. Yeah. As a matter of course. Yeah. 
I mean, look, the, we won't have the resources. I know. No, we don't have the resources, and but the you know have. the the courts are the courts system can be really slow. You know, I mean, it really is an issue. Yeah, I think they were just too slow going getting that DNA mm. match, and um, you know, then getting it, getting the file prepared. Yeah. Now, at the same time, Alan Bailey, who we also inv- in interviewed for Beast, says in one way that you only had one shot at him. Yeah. Yeah. I and they wanted well. to get all everything right. I can see that. I can understand that. I mean, how catastrophic would it have been had he walked again? Like, yeah. or had he, you know what I mean? Yeah. So they were going to go for this. It was going to be a very high profile case, Ireland's coldest case. And they wanted to get it right and have all their ducks in a row and, you know, get as many witnesses as possible. So, but um, so two no, interesting women, Sheila Sheila Willis and, and Maureen, I mean, I'd love to go back to them on, on other cases if we, yeah. in the new year, if we maybe think about taking on some more of these cold cases and investigating them. They probably won't be before the courts, but we might have a little look back and see if there's any of them worth delving into. And um, I love the science end of it. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. Even though obviously I don't totally understand it, no, <laughs> I do I do love the idea of the the whole. Well, I mean, if you look at it, that's 40, 41, 42 years ago. Mm. I mean, he really, really must have presumed he had gotten away with with murder, you know, and the confidence of the com- yeah. and you know he's seventy was it seventy one or two or whatever. So I mean, yeah. really, there's no minimum in life ter- sentences, but he's talking fourteen to seventeen years in prison. Mm. Like it's his, he must have got to retirement age, his bus pass, and thought <laughs> I'm a free man, I'm never going to be held accountable, and now he probably will be held accountable for the rest of his natural healthy life. So it is a, it is a great outcome for the family and for Absolutely. and jail. That's just like I mean, he's only had short little sentences yeah. in jail. I mean, anybody facing a life sentence, like he will die in jail. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But certainly, the rest of his probably natural yeah. healthy life will be in there, and it's not a pleasant place to be as mm. a, as an as a geriatric man, really. Like mm-hmm. you know, um, no. although there are a good number of sort of geriatric prisoners in there. Um, it's, 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 mm. look, it's must be. He's fitter than you. No, he wouldn't be fitter than me. <laughs> He'd be doing more than be, five no, kilometres, no. wouldn't he? No, he would not. Jody <laughs> will tell you, wasn't he running across the road to the courts he was, and he was yeah. super fit and everything? He d- jogs five kilometres three times a four week. Four times a week. Four times a week, excuse every me. Every day at the same time? At uh, the same, no, no. No, not every day, four times a week. Four times a week. <laughs> every and day of the week. He never wants to expand that to six kilometres, to seven, to eight, to nine, to ten. He never wants to do, do you know anything was, other than that. Do you know, there was one of those like hurricanes or whatever that <laughs> recently and I go out on a certain day at a certain time and it was, you know, one of these hurric- massive yeah. storms that were getting red warnings. And I thought about not going out and I thought, no, this is the time do I go well, for my run do you know and I'm what? going out anyway. We were having a conversation only mm. yesterday about booking lunch for yeah. Christmas yeah. and uh, Nicholas says, no, we'll, we'll go for two o'clock and Kiva says, and I'll really leave his head <laughs> if he doesn't have his lunch at one. <laughs> she was very concerned about oh, you. Oh, you're so gas, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. Ian got loads of time. What do I not get a thank you for? I know I didn't do any work on Beast, yeah. but I was a kind of a moral support for you. You're moral really, support. You always are. Not yeah, really. so really it comes you know, back to that, that sort of time. atmosphere that I've created that allowed this podcast to be. Christmas <laughs> <laughs> year from Rain Man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he's been like that for a long time. When he used to heat up this particular sandwich he bought, the it was sandwich. a wrap. It was a wrap. Excuse me, it was <laughs> a wrap, right? Mm. And he used to heat it up in the microwave when we were on the fourth floor. And Robbie Farrell used to sit there, thirty seconds. It has to be just thirty seconds. No longer than thirty seconds. No shorter than thirty seconds. It has to be thirty seconds. Well, it's it just shows you you have nothing going on in your life that <laughs> yeah. I am. Of I wish such I could stick to your routine Claude. that well. Anyway, I'll end my podcast now and thank <laughs> yeah. you very much to my guests. <laughs> thank and you very much for having us. Thank you so much. It's so nice. My podcast very soon. So nice to be here. Thank you very yes. much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts.